Um, well, I'm Art Matthews, most of you know me, mental health counselor here on campus, and I have asked uh, Mike Ayers, mm -hmm. is that correct? Yeah, Mike no Ayers. S, but yeah, Ayer, Ayer, Ayer. singular. Oh, I keep putting that S. From a new leaf to come and speak on campus on a very important topic of domestic violence, um, with this month being Sexual, Sexual Assault Awareness Month, um, we're a little out of sync with that, but I wanted to, I, I, it's all connected to me, to have sexual assault and domestic violence and harassment, um, all of those issues together. And what we're doing today is going to be a part of a new initiative that you're going to see lots of programming on campus related to domestic violence, sexual assault, dating violence, stalking and harassment. Um, you'll be looking for October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Mm -hmm. um, February is Stalking Awareness Month. And April being Sexual Assault Awareness Month. So Mike has come to us from a new leaf. He's a licensed clinical social yeah, worker there. Correct, yeah. And he's also worked as a victim's advocate for the Glendale Police correct, Department, yeah. correct? 23 years, yeah. Yeah, tw just 23 years. So. Okay. Well, thank you. I uh, appreciate being here. Uh, I hope I'm not on the wrong track, but I, I'm more focused on sexual assault, so I can, I can, I can handle domestic violence too, though. Um, did everybody get two documents? One is a brochure called Coping with Traumatic Events. They're over here on this behind the, the display. And the other is called The Axe Forgets. The Axe Forgets the Tree Remembers. Um, I want to start out with a little, uh, just uh, something for fun. Uh, if I can make the computer do what I want it to do. So without talking to your neighbors, without sharing, without comparing answers or notes, I want you to read the sentence and then count the number of times in that box that the letter F is in that box. That's all. And then write down your answer on one of those pieces of paper. So take just a, just a minute. There's no hurry. There's no trick in that box, in that rectangle, the number of times the letter F is in that box. I'll give you uh, 30 more seconds. Number of times the letter F is in that box. Okay, anybody need more time? Write it down, write down your number. We'll come back at, to that later. Uh, I spent uh, 23 years as a victim assistance caseworker with the Glendale Police Department. Uh, I'm a master's in social work. Uh, and my uh, job with Glendale PD was to respond to crisis uh, events, to deaths and to pool drownings and to uh, death notifications and sexual assaults and child molests. Uh, so I did that for about 23 years. And then the last four years, I worked for an agency called A New Leaf. A New Leaf used to be called back if you're a have been around Arizona very long, around Phoenix very long. It used to be called Prehab of Arizona or Prehab of Mesa back even before Prehab of Arizona. And they changed their name about four or five years ago to A New Leaf. Uh, and uh, A New Leaf pr has provided counseling in uh, advocacy centers uh, for about the last 15 years uh, for crime victims uh, in an in the old days, when I worked for Glendale PD, uh, if we had a sexual assault, we used to take the victim, we used to go to the, with the victim to a hospital. We would be in an emergency room, uh, Thunderbird Samaritan, and St. Joe's, uh, Good Sam, uh, Community Hospital. And we would be in the emergency room waiting for the doctor, waiting for the emergency room physician to have a block of time that the, that the physician could... Uh, could, could uh, devote to doing a forensic exam, an evidence gathering exam for that for that uh, victim, uh, as long as uh, uh, long as nine hours. Uh, uh, now, uh, in 1999, uh, Mesa opened up the Mesa Center Against Family Violence, the first domestic, the first uh, advocacy center in the state of Arizona. Uh, in Mesa, uh, Glendale opened theirs the next year. Child Hope opened the same year. Now there are six in the, in the Phoenix area. There's one in Scottsdale, there's one in Goodyear, there's one in Phoenix, there's one in Glendale, there's one in Mesa. There are 18 in the state of Arizona, including a mobile uh, advocacy center that, uh, that operates out of Flagstaff. 
that operates uh, in on the uh, on the reservation. They have uh, uh, forensic uh, evidence gathering, a medical uh, facility, uh, colposcope. Uh, they have uh, interviewing capabilities so that they can interview the the uh, the victim. Uh, so that the victim doesn't have to be interviewed multiple times. Uh, I remember we, in the old days we used to go to, to county hospital with children, uh, and I, so parent would bring the, would take a child, took a child to her doctor. The doctor said, "I can't do this exam. You have to go to county." They went to county hospital. The attending resident in the emergency room uh, uh, examined the child, and if the if there was evidence of trauma, then the then the resident wanted the attending physician to see the child. Uh, so, uh, so we'd go back again the next day. So three exams or three interviews, uh, multiple interviews. Uh, the advocacy centers are just uh, wonderful. One-stop centers for crime victims, including law enforcement. In, in some of the cases, Mesa, uh, Phoenix, and Goodyear all have child protective services uh, units in the facilities uh, so that CPS comes out uh, if, in the case of a child uh, and, uh, and does their interviews or does their interventions, whatever they have to do. The detectives come, victim assistance caseworkers, victim advocates, the nurse uh, comes to the, to the uh, advocacy center. There are six in the valley. Um, and there are 18 in the state of Arizona now. And it's been uh, just uh, a lot better than the old days when we used to go to an emergency room and sit and wait in an emergency room for usually for four hours. But like I say, one time it was nine hours. Uh, and <laughs> then uh, to add insult to injury, the victim got a bill for it. <laughs> so she got a bill for like you know, $1,400 for her wait in the emergency. We got it written off. We got the county attorney that, you know, they, 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 uh, uh, wrote off the, the bill. The victim didn't get uh, charged with it. Uh, statistically, I, I'm sure that, that you, you're probably aware that one out of four females has been a victim of some kind of unwanted sexual contact by the age of 20. One out of six. Uh, so if you're in a group like this where there's 15 people, odds are there, uh, every school I've ever been to uh, where I've had a group like this, 25 or 30 kids, every school I've ever been to, there's been somebody has identified themselves. Uh, I like the, uh, there's a quote under impact of rape. I'm not going to read the statistics. You guys can read the statistics pretty easily. The, the important part of it is that, that there are certain populations that have a higher incidence of sexual abuse. So in, in the general population, it's one out of four for women, one out of six for males. In college populations, it's higher. In military populations, it's higher. In minority populations, it's higher. Uh, on, the, on the reservation, in Native American populations, it's higher. So there are some populations where the incidence is higher than one out of four. Um, most, uh, uh, almost all sexual assault victims know their offender, know their abuser. Uh, it is, it is the, uh, it's the minority. Uh, in which the victim does not know their abuser. Uh, the incidence of pregnancy associated with sexual assault, uh, despite uh, statements about uh, legitimate rapes, the, the incidence of, of, sex, of pregnancy is about 5% uh, in sexual assault. Obviously, there are acquaintance rapes. Uh, the, the vast majority of sexual assaults are either by a family member or by an acquaintance. The vast majority of child sexual abuse is, is by a family member or by, by a relative. Uh, and then next by, uh, by a, uh, uh, an acquaintance. Um, the ordinary response to an atrocity is to banish it from consciousness. Certain violations of the social compact are too terrible to utter aloud, this is the meaning of the word unspeakable. That's why we say this is an unspeakable act. If it's unspeakable, it's unspeakable. Atrocities refuse to be buried. Remembering and telling the truth about terrible events are prerequisites for the restoration of social order and for the healing of individual victims. When the truth is finally recognized, survivors can begin to recover. But far too often, secrecy prevails and the story of the traumatic event surfaces not as a verbal narrative, but as a symptom. So uh, the way I look at it, uh, if I can figure out how to get back here, um, uh, 
Okay. This is, uh, this is my closet. Well, this is not my closet. I'll show you my closet in a second. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is, this, is a, this is a neat closet. I like you know, my shoes, especially. Yeah, my shoes. No, this is a neat closet. And so a lot of our memories are memories of our wedding, or memories of our childbirth, memories of a vacation, memories of a high school reunion, memories of high school years, of football games, or whatever it might be. Those memories we store in our mind and, we're, and we enjoy going back to them. We, we, we uh, activate them and engage them pretty easily and pretty comfortably. Uh, traumatic memories are not stored in quite this way. I like to think of it as a traumatic memory, whether it's a domestic violence incident, or whether it's a sexual abuse, or whether it's a, a drowning, whether it's a... I was in this tornado one time uh, where the buildings were destroyed, uh, whether it's a, a, an event like that. The closet door doesn't stay shut. We stuff the memories. We stuff the, the, the sensations, the perceptions, the feelings, and the memories into the closet, and we push the closet door shut, and the closet door has a defective latch. It has one of those little bitty latches that you get at Home Depot that has just about that much of a latch. And it takes the slightest trigger to spring the latch, and the door comes pushing open. And, and uh, the sensations come flooding out. So people, uh, sexual assault victims, domestic violence victims, victims of uh, uh, car crashes, uh, Tornadoes, hurricanes, natural disasters, uh, bombings, uh, Boston marathons, uh, Oklahoma cities. Those memories flood out on various kinds of triggers. A smell, a sound, a touch, uh, a sight. Uh, what's the other one? A taste. Uh, you know, so, when the, so when certain things happen, whether it's... Uh, watching the news and, and seeing an image and, and, and the, the closet door springs open and the victim tries to push the closet door closed and the door doesn't close and it doesn't stay closed. Uh, and that's the way traumatic memories are stored, whether they're domestic violence. Domestic violence involves not only an assault, but it also involves a betrayal. Uh, it, it's not just as simple as, it's not like me getting beaten up in a bar because I said something to the wrong person or something. It's a betrayal. You know, it's a betrayal. This person that you invested your life in and swore to, to love or, or, or spent the night with, whatever you did. Or my brother, my sister, my parent, my child, my, my girlfriend, my boyfriend, my, my spouse, uh, my grandchild, my grandparent, it's a betrayal. And, and so that's an extra part of, of, of what gets stuffed in the closet. And so this first quote, the, the quote about the ordinary response to atrocities is to banish them from consciousness. So the victim tries to forget it. Can you forget it? You can't forget it. You can't forget it because various kinds of triggers, a sound, a smell, I have one victim, she, a certain kind of cologne, she just fell apart. A certain kind of aftershave, a certain sight, when I was in this tornado in Louisville back in 1973, you could tell who had been in the tornado in 1973 because when the sky got to be a certain way, a certain darkness, with certain quietness, and a certain... Were you really? Oh my gosh, uh, my building had no roof. <laughs> uh, but you could tell because of the, of the, of the sight, of, of the sound of the sight, of the sound of a car crash, the sound of... Uh, the window breaking, the sound of the scream of the parent or the spouse, uh, those things that cause triggers and they cause the latch to come open. And I call them feeling flashbacks because a lot of times victims don't get the memory. They don't get the image. They get, they get the feeling. They get the flooding of the sensation of the body sensation and the feeling. Um, 
The ordinary response to atrocities is to banish them from consciousness. Certain violations of the social compact are too terrible to utter aloud. This is the meaning of the word unspeakable. Atrocities, however, refuse to be buried. Remembering and telling the truth about terrible events are prerequisites. So taking, cleaning out the closet, looking at the stuff, folding it up, and putting it back in the closet the way the other closet was is part of the healing process. That's part of what I do with clients, with crime victims. I mean, they, they would like to hide from it and not ever think about it again. And that's not possible. So many things, uh, a, a, a newspaper article, a, a friend, a sight, a smell, uh, different things that can cause, uh, that can trigger the, 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 the sensations. Uh, and so in the brochure, and on the second, on the back of the first page, where it says the uh, uh, the uh, impact, shock, and uh, disbelief, remembering what happened, intense emotions, physical symptoms, fears about safety, self blame, and shame. So, if you were having, if you were working in a medical facility, and I think that's where the students from here work, and probably the faculty has worked. Um, if I, I was thinking about my doctor, I assume my doctor may see patients. I'm going to give him 10 minutes to say for with each patient. I'm going to be generous. Okay, that would be six an hour. If he works an eight-hour day, that's 48 patients a day. If the statistics are accurate, that he's probably seen six, seven, eight, nine, ten sexual assault, sexual abuse victims sometime in that day. Uh, and certain smells, certain sights, certain... certain uh, uh, sensations cause those triggers. So in, uh, in the second page of the brochure, it has a list of physical and mental and emotional symptoms, and they're pretty much exactly the same as on this one. I, I got this from the Santa Monica Sexual Abuse uh, website, their, their, their advocacy center in Santa Monica, California, and I thought it was really well done. Um, but it's the same list. It's almost the same list. So I would say with a client, I want you to read through this list. And, and so we go through nausea, you know, feeling like you want to throw up. I can't, you know, I'm going to gag. I'm going to barf. Uh, shortness of breath, headaches, skin rashes, lack of energy, weight loss or gain, hyperventilation, rapid pulse, disturbed sleep patterns. I can't get to sleep. I keep waking up at night. I wake up early. Uh, mental and emotional reactions, embarrassment, feeling of guilt difficulty concentrating, uh, people, grades go down. I was an A student and now suddenly I'm, a, I'm, an F, I'm, a, I'm getting D's and F's. Uh, and the parents are saying what's going on and sometimes later on the, student, the, the, the child, the young person discloses to sexual abuse. Difficulty concentrating. I'm working on something, I'm reading something, I'm working on my paper and the next thing I know it's a half hour later and I haven't gotten a thing done. And my mind's back on uh, my trauma. Mood swings, sudden and unprovoked fear, anger, crying, irritability, giddiness, intrusive thinking, mind wandering, flashbacks, forgetfulness, memory lapses, difficulty showing emotion, inability to make decisions, disinterest in previously valued activities. I used to like to play soccer. I used to like to have sex. I used to like to go out for a drink. I used to like to dance. I used to like to go for walks. And now I just want to sit in my room all the time. I don't want to do anything. Uh, exaggerated startle reflex, the tree branch blows and you just about come out of your skin. Uh, there's, a, there's a loud sound, there's a sound, some, there's, a, there's a sudden person walks behind you and you just jump. Uh, I will ask clients, do any of these sound familiar? And they'll say, they'll check them off. You know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, or, or all of them. And I'll say, if, if that's true, then you're not having an abnormal reaction you're having a normal reaction to an abnormal event. It's the event that's abnormal. It's not your reaction that's, that's abnormal. Your, via, your, your reaction is normal. So if you had a client, if you had a patient in a, in a medical facility who uh, uh, was having abnormal reactions, uh, then uh, their triggers, I think the best thing to do is to just have materials available in a waiting area. We do shoe cards. We used to do shoe cards, little cards about domestic violence, about uh, a safety plan, about an emergency number, about a crisis number, a shelter number. We put them in laundromats. We put them in grocery stores. We put them in, in restrooms. Uh, uh, 
bars in, in, the, in the women's restroom, just a little shoe card, a little flip shoe card, uh, and, and uh, in places where a woman is going to find it, but a man is not going to find it. And the shoe cards are uh, the governor's office, uh, Maricopa, MAG, Maricopa Association of Government, gives them away for free. They give them away by the millions uh, for free. Uh, and they have uh, uh, shelter hotlines. They have uh, uh, a safety plan. Uh, they have a some of them will have what they call a lethality scale, which kind of identifies different factors that if, if these are present in your life or in your marriage or in your home, that your likelihood of being uh, killed, the lethality scale is higher. Um, so shock and disbelief. Most sexual assault victims react with shock and disbelief. They may feel numb and dazed, withdrawn, distant. Um, Remembering what happened, the, the, the memories keep coming back, especially at bedtime, especially in certain places or certain times. Uh, intense emotions, um, anger, sadness. That's the in, on the on the brochure. That's uh, the mood swings. Physical symptoms: sleep disturbances, headaches, stomach aches. The symptoms are on the brochure. Uh, fears about safety. Almost every victim, every crime. Uh, can't put enough locks on the doors. You know, can't, can't put enough locks on the doors. Um, sometimes I'll talk to uh, my victim. The world is different for women than it is for men. Maybe you've not noticed that. Uh, guys go to a movie theater and they get out of the movie at 9.30 at night or 10 o'clock at night and they walk to their cars and they're talking about the movie, they're talking about the Suns, they're talking about the Cardinals, they're talking about the... Red Sox, or they're talking about girls, or whatever they're talking about. Women get out of the movie at 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night, and they walk to their car. Uh, what are the women doing? What are they thinking about? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Where do they have their keys? Where do they have their keys? Where do they have the remote control? What do they do when they open that door? They lock, they look around, they lock the door as soon as they get in the car. The guys are still talking about the sons. You know, the world is different. In your campus, in your, in your parking lot, in, in the hospital, you know, I worked in a hospital in Louisville, and it was exactly that. When guys are walking out to the parking lot, and it's nonchalant, and women are walking out to the parking lot, and women have got the keys. You know, maybe they have their keys <laughs> in the stabbing, in the, in the stabbing uh, position. True or not? And it's true, and we have to, and, and, and we, we teach them. So uh, fears about safety, uh, self-blame and shame. Uh, why do why do why do victims tend to blame themselves? It's a rhetorical question. Almost everyone I've ever dealt with has said, "Shoulda, woulda, coulda, if only I had," and and. And the, the mere fact that we say those words, what is implicit in I shoulda? It's my fault. It's my fault. I shoulda. I shouldn't have had the drink. I shouldn't have uh, uh, got, pick, got, get, gone hitchhiking. I shouldn't have done whatever it was I did. I shouldn't have, uh, yeah. Keeps getting stuck. Keeps getting stuck. They replay the videotape. I, I, you know, we replay the videotape, and, and we tend to stop the videotape at the crisis moment. Where a lot of times, if we can continue playing the videotape a little bit longer, we get to safety. We call our friend. There was a guy who was, uh, uh, was his kids were playing in the yard. There was a truck. There was a semi truck backing down the road. He went out to grab the kid. The kid got away, but the guy fell down, and the truck was coming back to roll over the top of him. Uh, and so uh, in his dreams, he kept reliving the truck is coming back to crush him. He kept reliving the truck is coming back to crush him. The cr 
Except there's one thing wrong. He's still alive. The truck didn't crush him. He stops the videotape. When the wheel is here, he doesn't <laughs> you know, get pulled out. The, tr uh, the truck driver stops. The truck driver realizes. He screams. People scream. He gets up. He's fine. But he keeps playing the videotape. And the videotape, sto he stops the videotape when the, when the, tr when the wheel's got, getting ready to crush him. And so we try to get people play the videotape until they get to safety. Don't stop the videotape when the wheel's getting ready to crush you. Let somebody pull you out from under the wheel, get you to safety. If the medics come, my mom comes, my sister comes, when did you start to feel safe? That's what I would ask people when we go to the hospital. You know, what's your biggest concern? I'm afraid I'm pregnant, I'm afraid my boyfriend will, will, will blame me, I'm afraid my parents are going to blame me. I'm afraid I'm never going to enjoy sex again. I'm afraid I'm going to get STDs. I would say, what's your biggest concern? And they would, and they would I don't know what your biggest concern was. Uh, and, and, and that started, that started taking the crap out of the closet and starting to fold it up and put some order into it. And all of those acts are healing acts. Uh, self blame and shame. Uh, you, you probably are aware that in crisis theory, or in, in discussions about crisis, fight, fight, flight, and freeze. They used to say fight or flight. There's a fight, you know, adrenaline, the, 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 uh, the amygdala creates this fight or flight. Well, it's more fight, flight, or freeze. There are times when people just stop. There's a, there's a, 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 a website on, on the next page uh, by uh, in fact, her quote is on the first page. Now, I don't have the kind of separate pages. Uh, her quote, uh, Jillian Morning, the very bottom quote on the first page. Uh, she, she's a 19 year old girl who uh, had, had a modeling gig. She was a real pretty girl, cheerleader, A student, straight A student, uh, you know, nice, good girl. Uh, and she was uh, uh, set up and then raped by her. Dirty. I was physically hurt, but even more, I was emotionally broken. The denial, the hate, the shame, the embarrassment, self blame, the realization of vulnerability were all consuming my mind. I remember thinking, how does something like this happen to me? To someone who is intelligent, accomplished, never tried a drug, never been in trouble, let, let something like this happen. I decided I would take that time to my grave. I had built a place in my childhood for all the abuse and trauma that I thought I could hold all this trauma. into the closet, I closed the door, and I could survive it. And until she opened the closet, and she started taking things out, and she started folding them up and put the blame where the blame belonged, and started sorting them out, you know, until that happened, she didn't start to get better. She didn't start to heal. Uh, I want to talk about consent on the, on the third page. There's one that, uh, yeah, this half page. Consent, it, to me, is a fascinating subject. There's a, there's a group... Uh, in at ASU that uh, does these uh, student, uh, in fact, they do a sexual, sexual assault prevention month this month. Uh, and they do this, and they get shown. She says, I always get consent. I always get consent. Consent means that the person is capable of consent. They're old enough to make a decision, and they're not mentally impaired. Remember the judge in Montana that, that uh, like sentenced the rapist to 50 two-year-old rapist, a school teacher, 14-year-old girl, and the rapist, 14-year-old girl, and the judge said that she was older than her years. And he said she got 30 days in jail, and she committed suicide. And uh, the judge defended his decision. He said he was misunderstood, but he defended his decision. Capable of consent. 14-year-old can't sign a contract to buy a car. 14-year-old can't sign a contract to buy a house, a 14-year-old can't, can't get married, a 14-year-old can't get, get, a, get a credit card, a 14-year-old can't go to the doctor's office and sign in and get their own medical treatment. Uh, voluntary, freely offered, that it is not coerced, forced, manipulated, or by threat. Consent means consent. Sober, the person is alert, awake, not intoxicated, not drugged. 
you understand, I remember one victim in Glendale, she consented to oral sex. She didn't consent to intercourse. And when the guy started to have intercourse with her, it became a rape. Now, how do you prove that in court of law? What jury's gonna, what's the jury gonna come back with? What kind of finding is the jury gonna come back with? Uh, but she has a right to consent to what she wants to consent to. And, she, and he doesn't have a right to do what, he, what she didn't consent to. And clearly communicated, yes. And we have this confused, confused, confused time. Uh, young women see sexual assault as normal. It was in Huffington Post last week. Last week. And the girl said, she's 13 years old, and she says, uh, you guys are always uh, grabbing her bottom, pinching her bottom. They try to touch you in the front. It's normal. It's just what guys do. What a scary world. And that's what the, you know, the big little girl, 13 year old, it's, it's normal. I don't get upset about it because it's just, that's normal. How we teach kids that that's, uh, that that's not normal. But uh, consent has to be capable, capable of consent, voluntary, sober, informed, and clearly communicated. I was called out of Linda Police one time on a sexual assault. This lady worked at the Circle K. She was a young lady, she was about 22 or 23 years old. She was, uh, she lived, her family lived in Ohio. She was out here, lived by herself. She had an apartment. Had no furniture in her apartment. She works the circle K. Guy came in every day. They kind of talked. They kind of flirted. You know, he's single. She's single. There was nothing wrong with that. Pretty, pretty reasonable expectations. Uh, at one point, they're talking, and she says she doesn't have. Uh, she doesn't have a TV. He says, well, I've got an extra TV. I'll, I'll buy you a TV. So they said, come on, you know, how about your day off? We'll go over to my house. We'll get the TV. We'll go over to your house. So they go over to his house, get the TV, come back to her house. She has no furniture. She has a mattress in the bedroom. So they set the TV down, and they're watching, and she fixes something to eat, and, and they're uh, watching TV, and they start kissing, they start making out, they start hugging, they start touching, they start taking clothes off. It's consensual. It's consensual. She's, it's, it's consensual. Just row, taking clothes off, hugging, kissing. He penetrates her, and she says, stop. She stops. What? What? What did I do? What did I do? She said, just leave. Just leave. He so He gets up, dresses, and leaves. She calls the police and reports a sexual assault. Now, do we want to have a vote here? <laughs> Anybody have any opinions about this? The officer calls victim assistance because she's so upset. He calls his sergeant. The sergeant says, I don't think he had a rape. Once she said stop, he stopped. It was all consensual. Once she said, let's see, yes, clearly communicated. Uh, she, it was not a rape. Now, she was very, very upset uh, and felt that she did not want to happen what had happened. But it was not a crime. No crime had occurred. Now, move fast forward. With Glendale Community College with the baseball team group like this, except there's about 40 people. Tell that sort of same story. Guy back in the base. You mean, you mean if we're, and she says, stop, I got to stop. Later on in the group. You mean, Later on, you mean <laughs> over and over and over. Uh, but it was an excellent example of consent means consent. And when she said no, he did the right thing. Now, she may wish she had done something differently, but he did the right thing. You know, once what, what had happened was consensual, was communicated, was informed, was sober, was voluntary, and she was capable of consent. And when she said stop, he stopped. So uh, rape can be at a certain point, and then, and then it, no, consent can be at a certain point, and then, and then it stops. And when it stops, and that's why the, you know, we live in such a gray area, like the little girl, the 13 year old girl that says the guys are grabbing the bottom and they try to touch you in the front, and, and it's just what people do. It's not rape. Okay, let me go back to.
Okay. How many of you, did you write down the number? Yeah. Everybody write down the number? How many of you, anybody write down one? Anybody write down two? Anybody write down three? Okay, there's three. Anybody write down four? There's four. Anybody write down five? Anybody write down six? There's about six or seven people. Okay. Let's see, let me have a who, who wrote down three? Can I, will you come up? <laughs> can, I, can I drag you up? Okay, how many do you see? Read, read, the, read in the box. How many do you see? It's Marsha, right? Yes. How many do you see? How many do you see? How many do you see? Three. Three. Okay. How many do you see? Three in the box. How many do you see? I have You see six in the box. You see three in the How many do you look at it again? Okay. Trish and Marsha. Come here. How many of you see? How many of you see? Okay. Trish, go ahead and point out. Oh, you can't see them. They're too high. Well, I already know what's going to happen. Okay. What's it say? Well, there's an F in Spanish to file, but then there's the um and the uh both have an F. Oh. Oh. And then there's some other stuff to see as well. Right. So in the big words, there's like three words. Every group I've ever that's been in, I've done this a dozen times. We pronounce them as Bs. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, we, don't, we don't see them as, as we read them, maybe we think of okay. them as Bs. Uh, I always want to, I wanted, I tried to find this uh, video. I was doing this at, at, a, at one of the advocacy centers with law enforcement people. And I want to show this video of Sergeant Joe Friday. And I want him to say, okay, ma'am, uh, just the facts. Just the facts. How many, of, how many Fs are in the box? So what one of us sees is not necessarily what the next one sees. We don't all see the same thing. Sexual assault is the same way. Uh, the, the girl, the young lady, the circle K girl, she felt that she had been raped. Um, and I saw her counseling, and, and, and I, I got to tell her, you know, I guess if I'd had this list of consent and, you know, when you said no, he stopped and you could be rational about it, but she felt like she had been raped. That she, you know, she had been uh, led into a situation where she did not want to she didn't know what to do, what, 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 what happened. Uh, even though she was, she could have left the room. And when she said stop, he stopped. But the guy in, in, in the baseball team, you know, the you me, you me, you me, you know, in his mind, if we got that far, it's consent. If we got that far, it's consent. You know, if you let me touch you, if you let me give you, Maybe it's buy you a drink, maybe it's go to my car, maybe it's go to my apartment, maybe it's whatever it is, but you let me buy you a drink or whatever it is, that that was consent. But I, you know, consent to me has to be <coughs> capable of consent, conscious, aware, sober, informed, and communicating. Yeah. There's a, a program now uh, on the college campuses for undergraduates where they're saying that also communicating often. Okay. So that you have to get consent for each thing you're going to do. And it has to be enthusiastic. Yeah. Yes. Antioch, <laughs> Antioch College, anybody ever heard of Antioch College in Ohio? Okay. They had a policy a requirement of students that they had ever written consent. Um, that uh, uh, couple when they they were going to have sex. They had that written consent. Uh, and uh, I don't know that it's still going on. I've, I've heard that it's not, that they eliminated that, that requirement. Uh, but uh, I don't know how realistic, <laughs> you know, <laughs> how doable that is. It is. What do you suggest uh, if we suspect a student? Huh? What do you suggest if we suspect a student that's went through this and showing these signs? A sexual assault? Mm -hmm. Well, the best thing I think, that ideally, 
is to have, if you have in your facilities, if you have somewhere on the campus, and I'm betting that Art has these available, that you have brochures. The, uh, on the back, uh, uh, the organization called RAIN, R-A-I-N-N, Rape Abuse and Incest National Network, it's, this is a, an organization, Tor, there's a, a quote by Tori, Tori Amos on the, on the quote page, she's part of RAIN. She's on the board of directors of RAIN. They have a website, they have a Facebook page. Uh, RAIN is, uh, they have brochures, they have uh, materials, handouts, uh, they mail, uh, mail sexual assault, they have uh, acquaintance rape, uh, uh, they have materials of all sorts on the RAIN website. The second one, the national, uh, the, uh, the last one, the NSVRC, uh, the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, it also has materials available. What I do, I think if you had brochures in your, in your, in your uh, public areas, if you have a student union, if you have a, a, a student center, if it has a brochure about whatever it might be, uh, if you have brochures about sexual assault awareness, RAIN has brochures that you can download and you can print and you can, and you can change so that you can have your phone number, your, your how to access student services here, the, the mental health services here. Um, the National Sexual Assault Hotline, I would think that anything like that ought to have it. The orientation, I mean, if you have, if you have a classroom, this classroom seats 200, I think, maybe. This classroom seats 200. If there, if there was a classroom full of women in this classroom, odds are, that 40 and 50 of them are sexual assault survivors. And so if you have students, if there's 50 students in the student union, in the, in the, in the, in the snack bar, in the, in the cafeteria or something, odds are that there's, that there's a large number of those that are sexual assault survivors. Uh, if you have a public address, a, a public service announcements available through the university, oh, if there's a newspaper, uh, the numbers are available. Uh, I think that uh, uh, if you see people that start to get upset, you know, it, 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 it may be triggered. It, it, a conversation like and I'm a very aware that, that a conversation like this might trigger the closet door to start open. Yeah. But, uh, we also have staff from our dental clinic here. And uh, from my perspective, nothing more intimate than somebody being inside of my mouth when I go into the dental chair. And if somebody has been sexually assaulted and becomes triggered, uh, perhaps in the dental chair through smells or feelings or closeness, uh, you can talk point. a little bit about that, but I also know that you all have the, the um, Bright program and the, the clinical social worker that works with that, and that would definitely be a call to make Victoria. Victoria. Yeah, Victoria Michaels is a wonderful resource for our, our clinic, mm -hmm. certainly, if there are those triggers that happen with any of our patients. I have we those. try to educate our students to be aware and recognize any signs and symptoms, stop procedure, or you know, come back to people and kind of help guide them. Many times they will be guided to the right program. I have had situations where a child, uh, and, and we have been really talking about children because it's a total world, uh, for keeping secrets. Uh, the fact that somebody keeps a secret for, for a year, two years, three years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, whatever, keeping the secret, that means that closet door has been jammed shut for 20 or 20 or 25 years. I have a lot of clients who come back through this child sexual therapy, child sexual abuse survivors about open your mouth. Boy, just imagine the triggers that are going on. Uh, 
She worked in a dentist's office, and she disclosed her sexual abuse to her doctor, to her dentist, to her boss. And they called the police, and, uh, but she disclosed because she and her friends at GCC would sit over at this uh, jack-in-the-box across the street, and these guys are all, they're talking about sex, and they're talking about, you know, hookups and all this stuff. And this girl says they all thought I was a virgin, and I had been having sex since I was four years old. And I knew more about sex than any of them could imagine knowing about sex. And she uh, she actually, that led her to disclose to her, to her boss, the dentist. Uh, and and uh, it was interesting. Her father was arrested, her, it was her natural father. She'd been having sex with her since she was four years old. Anal sex, oral sex, uh, uh, since she was four years old. She was 19, beautiful girl. Uh, she wanted to go visit him in jail. She wanted to go visit him in jail. And all the, the Detective doesn't want to see that. Doesn't want to, you know, that's going to screw up the case. The, the prosecutor doesn't want, to, want doesn't want her to go see this guy in jail. Her mother is. Why are you wanting to go see this guy? He's been, you know, raping you since you were four years old. She loved him. He's her father. Well, she got one syndrome. She loved him. She yeah. loved him. She she didn't want him to go to jail. She didn't want him to go and be raped in prison and all. She wanted him to quit. Screw it, her. You know, that's all she wanted. She just wanted him to leave her alone. Uh, but she uh, she outed herself because of this uh, this peer group that she just she said I felt like like my head was going to explode. I felt like my head was going to explode. So I think that you guys have uh, I don't know anybody has school teachers have had tremendous opportunity to uh, to 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 be the one that is disclosed. But medical professionals, especially some people, uh, especially in the special students, and I always used to tell my clients, I you know, I'm really a male, and uh, I was the one that was on call that day, and that's why I came to the house, and, you know, we didn't <coughs> arrange to follow up later on. Uh, and, you know, I, uh, my clients now, you know, I really tell them male, but I, once we get right to the eyes, we usually kind of get to where it may need to be healing. Six homicides. Yeah, this is good. This and is I think uh, the trauma is trauma. Yeah. And that portion, I think, is. I've been involved in six domestic violence homicides uh, where I uh, responded to the scene. A uh, seven year old girl, a 13 year old girl was a neighbor of mine. Uh, who's, uh, what we know in, in domestic violence is that if the person is starting to leave, that's the most dangerous time. So she says, I'm Suicides in Maricopa County in the last year. Uh, five murder suicides. They all had domestic violence, obviously. They were, they were all domestic violence boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, parent, child, domestic violence uh, homicides. But uh, I'll tell you one, one domestic violence homicide that I went on that's probably stuck with me more than any other. I got called to, uh, to, to talk to a pastor. Vietnamese man. And this woman had been killed and she had gone uh, to her church to a pastor uh, 
when she was being abused by her husband. And the pastor had advised her to stay with him because God wants you to stay in this relationship and wants you to support your, your spouse. That's, that's the plan. That's God's plan. That's the biblical plan. So the pastor is kind of minimizing uh, you know, what, what, what had happened in that conversation. Uh, his role in, in not telling her it's okay to leave. Uh, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, there are eight domestic violence shelters in New York County. There is a national domestic violence shelter hotline. Uh, women do not want to go to the domestic violence shelters mostly because they're afraid of, of they've heard horror stories and, and we none of us want to, to to lose our own control and our own independence. You know, I'm 68 years old and I know at some point I'm gonna get older, my kids are gonna put me in a nursing home or something. None of us want to lose our independence and, and, and going to a shelter. But uh, there's a shelter without walls, uh, which is a good program, uh, so that you get the same kind of support. Uh, Order protection uh, services that you get in the shelters. Uh, the Jewish Family and Children's Services runs shelter without walls, um, and, I, and I think it's a, a, a fantastic uh, innovation in, in the domestic violence shelter business. Police departments in most municipalities now have a pro-arrest policy. It used to be back in the 60s that there was kind of like, uh, okay, you guys go and cool off, and it was a, a family matter, and uh, now most of so that when they get there, if, it, if there's evidence that crimes occur, they're going to arrest the abuser. Almost all courts now require uh, counsel. Uh, it used to be that it was 10 weeks of counsel, which is like kind of like, I hope I grabbed that one. Now in most cases, it's 30 or 36 weeks of counsel. The abuser has to, uh, has to pay for the counsel. In those situations where Police have made an arrest because of signs of abuse. The victim does not have to file charges, correct? Correct, correct. If there is evidence that a crime has occurred, if there are injuries, if there are broken windows, if there's a broken mirror, if there's a photograph, if a picture frame is broken, uh, or if there are bruises on the person, the, 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 the prosecutor in Arizona is the county attorney, but it's a felony, it's a municipal prosecutor if it's a misdemeanor, but, the, but they're the ones that made that. Prosecuting without the cooperation of the victim is still fairly rare, but it does happen. Um, and, and there are movements to try to, there are more movements now to try to, to prosecute uh, both parties, which is kind of sad. From, from where I am, it's, it's very sad. The other thing is we have employee benefits available. You know, we have an EAP program, which is an 800 number assistance that we have online and those types of things to so all employees, even if you don't have our insurance. So it's one of the things that we offer to all employees. And we have ART as a great resource here. And the CARE 24 people that answer the phone for uh, United will help with locating whatever services the person needs. Um, so, you know, if you're working with a patient or you're working with a client or a student, and you need an answer, you call the care center phone number and tell them what you need. They'll probably be able to give it to you too if, I, if I'm not available or if it's after hours or something like that. Um, and we've got uh, information from a new leak. We've got information from the Mesa Public uh, Police Department as well. Um, thank you. Thank you. Very you, much. Thank you. Thank you.